been taken seriously, uh, which would be binge eating disorder. It's always been a lesser um, eating disorder that has been um, kind of shrugged off, I think, by a lot of the medical community. Um, so this is a roller coaster ride for me on a daily basis, and I bring that to our discussion today because a lot of the images and a lot of the media messages that we get on a daily basis really uh, impact uh, everybody uh, in a similar way. So uh, I will share some of those uh, thoughts and experiences with you as we continue on. And I'll turn it over to Helen now to introduce herself and I'm going to see if I can sort out my settings here. All right. Can you hear me? Hopefully that's better. So um, I teach with the Toronto District School Board. I'm very proud to be a TDSB teacher. I, most of my time has been in, in Scarborough in the east end of Toronto. Currently I teach at a, a, an amazing school in the northern Scarborough area called Silver Springs Public School. And for the last eight years I've been teaching seven eights in two different schools. Oh, can't hear me. How is that? I just adjusted my volume. Yay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you are all so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, I teach grade seven, eight. Um, I would say equity has always been something that I have worked from that stance that has been important to me. Um, and so this work is also falls under that the work that I, I really dedicate my um, I would say my life to in terms of teaching and beyond um, around teaching from an anti-oppressive, anti-racist, anti-black racist equity lens and um, really through that passion um, I was lucky enough to be able to to do this work to be honest because uh, it is something that I feel passionate about like Heather of course, and uh, maybe like many of you too that are listening, this is something that's very personal. And so when it's personal, sort of identity politics, if you will, sometimes it's hard to, to work from that, that lens when it's something personal to you because sometimes you think other people think you have an agenda and that you're trying to sell your cause. And it's not about being on a soapbox. It's about really trying to, more than anything, um, create that health and wellness space for everyone in every aspect, whether we're talking about um, gender, race, culture, religion, um, and all of our different identities that we hold. And so this is something very personal, but also very that I feel very passionate about. So uh, again, we can't thank you enough for being here. And more than anything, thank you for being patient with us as we try with sound and stuff. And I think... We're, we're good to go uh, at this point. So um, that's who Heather and I are. Just as a note, uh, we met, uh, Heather and I met about 20 years ago now, uh, almost 20 years, where we were with, at, we were writing um, some, doing some work with Etfo, who has a similar, different, but uh, under the, the umbrella of body image and self-esteem work, there's a whole, if you're a teacher, and especially an elementary teacher, you can access the body image project uh, through Etford, so it's called Reflections of Me, and it's a K to eight curriculum, and there's a document for each separate curriculum as well that you can buy at a minimal cost. So even when I used to be a teacher librarian, and as Heather was, we would buy it for the library so that it, all the whole school had access. So, um, so that's where the work start and where it continues with Netic now. Thank you. So one of the things that really, uh, I think, motivated um, NEDIC 
uh, to reach out to Helen and myself uh, for this webinar opportunity uh, were a number of the images that uh, almost immediately started to appear on social media as soon as um, we were looking at quarantine uh, across the country and around the world. Um, I want to say that probably within the first week or so uh, of us being assigned uh, assigned to home <laughs> or, or put at home, uh, I started hearing something about COVID-15. Uh, and at first I thought it was another, um, another illness that was circulating around the world. Uh, but COVID-15 was actually kind of in just uh, referring to like the freshman 15 idea of that everybody was going to put on 15 pounds, just like, you know, everybody puts on 15 pounds when they go off to university. Um, and so the number of images that were starting to pop up on Facebook and Instagram um, and uh, some of the other social media sites, uh, Helen went in and, and in about 10 minutes managed to grab uh, all of these. Um, and these are some of the images that we're being surrounded by. These are the things that our teens are seeing uh, being sent around. We're seeing. Um, on all the different social media platforms. Uh, we're seeing them on TV, we're seeing them on the news. Um, and it's that whole idea of um, sizeism, body shape, size, uh, is still the last frontier of humor. It's still something that, uh, seem, you know, everyone seems to think that we can make fun of, uh, that it's a joke. Uh, you know, we take a look at this young toddler here who is, in, by all stretch of the imagination, a healthy young toddler who is out on the beach. And now this cute picture of this little toddler has been turned into a meme um, with, you know, this tagline slapped up on it. Uh, can you imagine how that child would feel in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, knowing that, uh, you know, this, this adorable picture of a healthy child has been turned into a joke. Um, so this was some of our motivation in wanting to get this out because we know that as parents, uh, having all these images coming across the screen and, and being on the devices that our kids are using, we don't necessarily know how to talk to them about, you know, being critical of the, of the images that, the, that are being shared with them. And, uh, you know, how do we combat this and how do we talk to our kids to make them understand that this is not okay, this is not acceptable, this is not uh, what society should be. I don't know if you want to pop in, Helen. No, that's, yeah, that's okay. Um, we're we're going to come back to this, to be honest, but we wanted to steep the work that we're presenting today in this, especially around this time. But I, the only thing I wanted to ask, uh, thank you, Heather, is that um, this isn't new. This is just COVID new. But this isn't new, right? This mocking is not new. This um, um, allow, allowing ourselves to talk like this. Um, I want you to put yourselves in any situation, any sp different space other than maybe your home. And there may be talk in the staff rooms if you're a teacher, um, at parties, uh, family parties where it's like, I shouldn't eat that, or that's going to go straight to my thighs, or I'm working on my summer body, or all of that rhetoric is really what we are challenging. This is what we're talking about in terms of bias. The wording, the words that we use, the language we use, the pictures, the images that we will be okay with, but if it's about a different um, topic, we're not okay with. So this is um, this is where for some we, you know for some of you you might be on that journey of like yep exactly I've, I'm I'm really conscious of that and for others it's 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 becoming you're becoming conscious so if we could go to the next and the next slide I'll just go through a, a few so here are the questions right like what is body image what is it when we talk about that um, sometimes when we when we we talk about sizeism. It limits itself to size in terms of the body image is more than the more than size. For example, the, how do we define it? And then the, this third question is key: How do the experiences of our children, okay, what they go through, not only impact them but us as the adults in their lives? Okay, we can go next. Okay. 
And so here we see a definition from Medic. All right? And I'm going to leave it there so that you can read it as well. And I'm going to just sort of um, annotate it a little bit. Really, it's how we see ourselves, but it's also how we think others see us. Right? So that whole relationship between what we see but how we think others see us is the real relationship there in that definition of body image. And then how that perception affects us. How it affects our self-esteem. How it affects our self-love. Okay? That really is the, the, the base of what body image is. And so how we see ourselves in any dimension uh, and how we think others see us is all-inclusive. And so here we have just some questions, just some thoughts around that definition. And as we head into the next slide, um, what we what we become very aware of and what a lot of the research has shown that Medic has done and many different organizations have have done uh, over the last several uh, last few decades is that um, you know there are some key developmental stages for our kids and so for anybody uh, in our audience today who have children at home um, you know, as early as age three or four, the, our, our kids are really starting to get a sense of physical concept. They're starting to get a more concrete understanding of what, um, you know, what their body is, uh, what it represents. Um, they're starting to develop a sense of gender um, and the traditional um, kind of societal um, determinants of what a male gender is, what a female gender is. Uh, they're, they're starting to develop the self-concept. You know, they're starting to compare themselves as they get into kindergarten, grade one and grade two with, uh, am I as tall as the other kids in my class? Am I the tallest? Am I the shortest? Uh, am I the fastest runner? Um, you know, what color, um, what color is my hair versus what color the other student's hair in? They're looking at skin color. They're looking at, you know, I know for myself, even as a four-year-old, it was, I had the most freckles in the class, and that was always a conversation, right? You know, well, what are these things on Heather's face, and are they okay? Are they normal? Because for some kids, they didn't have freckles, and so they didn't know what they were. Um, so kids are starting to form that physical concept. By the time we're getting into ages 8 to 10, um, our, our kids are starting to really uh, identify different gender differences and the importance of looks really start to emerge and we see that uh, in our Canadian society in particular with the number of different stores or in North American society with the number of different stores that are actually now uh, purposely marketing towards kids you know we have justice we have um, La Senza Junior we have stores where they've actually you know taken adult clothing and made it for the younger kids. Uh, and they market it that way. They market it with the, the flashy neon colors and the glitter and the sparkles and everything. Um, so our kids, by the time they're getting to be eight to 10 years of age, are really into that, particularly girls. And then as our kids get into the ages around puberty, um, puberty kind of rules all at that point, right? There's the constant comparison of, um, what's happening with their bodies you know am i developing too fast am i developing too slow um what do i look like on the outside how are friends how are peers observing me and that's really where that body at each of these stages body image is huge but particularly for our teenagers that's where that body image of how do i perceive myself and how do i perceive others as seeing me really starts to take uh, control and on the second half of this slide here, when we take a look at social influences, um, it's almost a little bit of a, it's kind of a, um, a pyramid where, you know, our family is really our first locus of control for any kind of social influence. But as we 
get older as we move from being under the care of family first into the school system and then out into the great big world, family is kind of the tip of the iceberg. School starts to have a huge social influence on kids and then peers take over as the number one social influence and finally media. Uh, and so by the time our students, our kids are teenagers, um, they've got the influence of all four of these key areas providing input to them and that's what's helping them form their sense of self. And if the if what they're getting bounced back at them, if the reflection that they're seeing is distorted, um, that's what's really kind of setting in as their their self concept. I've adjusted my mic. Okay. Is that better? Thank you, everyone. I've never been known to be <laughs> too quiet. So <laughs> if it's too loud, you're living the real Helen dream here. <laughs> she actually doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> All right. She'll see me in person. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for the feedback. Um, all right. So we're really looking at, uh, my friends out there, we're looking at uh, the media and the curriculum that we've written and we really want you to go access it please it's all free it's a grade four day curriculum we're going to get into it in a, a later in, in a just a bit but it's all free um, pdf all online it's grade four day specific uh, with netic however it so crosses great you know i would say like eight age you know birth to beyond um so we're really looking at that, this focus on the media within the curriculum, but even within today, as, as Heather stated before, we're so we're always inundated with media. But right now we're really sitting at our computers, at the TV, et cetera, constantly um, being faced with those, that media message, those media messages, excuse me. So how do we use media to, to discuss an issue? But how do we use the issue to discuss media as well? It's that partnership and media curriculum really is twofold, analyzing media and creating media. So the curriculum that we've developed with Netic has both of those streams in there. A lot of times they're analyzing because we need to. And, and even if you look at the image here, um, Netic put this out. This is on the side of a, a, one of the bus shelters a few years ago. And um, But look at the, the power of this message. Me messaging is powerful, right? Media, there's lots of diff, that, you know, media is about making money, but media is also about educating as well. And we can use it to our advantage with our, with our beautiful children that we have in our care. And so even the shed your weight problem here, looking at also all of the different, I know I teach 7-8, I'm trying to TikTok with them, I'm trying to Snapchat with them, I'm trying, not really, really succeeding, but... Uh, one of the things to reach my children, I'm going to be honest with you too, it's, is um, I have a teacher account on Instagram. And uh, for a lot of kids, that access to me on there to be able to message, but even to, you know, what I post, I'm very conscious of. Um, i posting stuff even from the classroom. There's that connection all of a sudden, right? So media, while sometimes as the adults, you know, we like to really, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a positive force in, in our lives. It can be. And social media can be. Social media has transformed and created movements, positive social justice movements around the world, for example. And so how can we use this with our children? And how can we um, arm them with the, the, the tools to be able to use it for good? So if we can go... Right, and here as well, we cannot say, I remember years ago, I think it was Frontier College said, no one's really illiterate because we can read signs, right? We can recognize symbols and that's a type of reading. And in the early years, we'll talk about environmental print, right? If, if children are able to read, you know, the Tim Hortons or, or know that the Golden Arches is McDonald's, it's a form of literacy. So when we're analyzing media, we're even honoring the fact that if we look here, probably our children, even really young children, and I have a nephew who's in senior kindergarten who's five years old, 
he'd be able to recognize and read these, right? So we're analyzing and we're integrating these pieces. Beautiful. And if I can. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so, you know, really one of the key aspects that we want to be able to instill in, in children, uh, and we do it as educators at school, we, we have a specific, uh, you know, curriculum uh, area that's called media literacy. But um, it's something that we can be doing in our houses, in our homes at any time. It's just teaching our, our kids to be critical of media, teaching ourselves to be critical of media. I'm sure we've all had that, you know, uh, opportunity of, of sitting and watching TV. And if you still watch kind of the the old the old style of TV on cable, uh, where there's commercials, um, you know, you're watching a show and then you realize five or six commercials in, it's every single uh, commercial has been for a different fast food restaurant. Um, and then you know, there's all of a sudden a Weight Watchers commercial thrown in. Um, you know, that is that is done on purpose. That, you know, there's placement of ads, there's placement of products in everything that we see and, and, and we watch and we observe. Uh, and it is all, it's all very much planned. So, you know, we want to think about what are some of the critical media literacy skills that are important for our kids to develop. They, they, it's important that they, they realize that what they are seeing on screen isn't actually indicative of what things look like or what things um, you know, necessarily are, are natural in, in society. Um, you know, I, I watch my, my son, you know, I, we were pretty safe there for a while. It was mostly TVO and, and Treehouse, if I'm allowed to name channels that he watched. Um, but even on those shows, they, you know, that when, as a toddler, the toddler, toddler shows were pretty safe and pretty careful about messages, uh, exposed. But as we start to get into some of the, um, you know, TV shows that are in, meant for age seven and up, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of stereotypes being portrayed for, for kids. You know, the assumption is that every household has uh, two parents, uh, you know, male and female. And they live in a big house and every child has their own bedroom and they have all these, you know, great opportunities around them and they go off for vacations and everything. And that's not reality for so many of our families. Um, so we need to be able to get <clears throat> get our kids looking at what's being shown to them at a very young age, and realizing that it's not um, it's not the picture of, of what reality is, um, and that certainly links to body image development. Um, you know, I, in watching some of the the movies that we've been watching at home while we've been here, uh, you know, revisiting classic movies. Um, with with Disney, et cetera, if I can start, I'm going to keep dropping names here. <laughs> but uh, in watching Ice Age and the number of fat jokes that are embedded in the dialogue of Ice Age about Manny being a mammoth, um, you know, it got to the point where I, 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 I had to turn it off because um, it's embedding at such a young age in my son that there's something wrong with the word fat. That fat is a funny word, and it's a word meant to insult. Uh, same with for anybody who's watched uh, the Marvel movies, and um, you know the 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 intended joke in Endgame is that um, Thor lets himself go and becomes fat because he's depressed because he wasn't able to save the world, and he's actually referred to as Fat Thor. Um, and it's it's just cringeworthy, and it and it's um, you know, the whole idea that he's let himself go and he has to get himself back together and he has to become spelt again in order to uh, really be a superhero. So those are, you know, some of the images that kids are, are, are seeing on a daily basis, particularly right now. Um, and we have to be able to develop the skills in them to say, you know, why is this not appropriate? Why is this not accurate? And, and how do we uh, help them talk about what they are seeing. Okay, we'll go on from there. Yeah. 
When we look at tools in order to be able to critically analyze media, we're looking at different things like the core concepts that we have here, and in the corner even the media triangle of text audience and production and having children even analyze. If you look at these key questions here, right, who, who created this media message and why? What was the purpose, right? Um, further to what Heather was, was sharing in terms of even popular uh, characters out in media, et cetera, when we look at size, we can also look at skin color as well, right? Do we have that beautiful picture book that I was gifted to by one of my besties, Solwe, uh, by Lupita Nu uh, Nuongo, for example, is a whole picture book around this little girl who's darker and the the stress that she goes through being made fun of in that way and uh, and and learning to love herself. And so even when we look at characters, uh, we can look at, in terms of body image, all different size, shape, color, uh, you know, race, representations in, in so many ways, or how are women represented as opposed to men. For example, um, one thing that we've used in workshop that I brought, for example, is taking out um, ads. We all have magazines, et cetera. What's cool in this picture, right? Why are they, why are they, why is she sitting like this? What is valued? What is valued? And when we look at mag magazines, I know I've talked, even when I taught grade five, six, we talk straight out. We need to talk openly and honestly with our children. They know, they see. It, we can't save these conversations for when they're 16. And I'm looking at the chat about, you know, Miss Slim Fast and, um, and even expecting educators to disrupt exactly, you know, like looking at the name branding and how, uh, you know, how that they're, um, what they're seeing and how they're interpreting what they're seeing, right? And so what does an ad like this do? And this, and so we talk about what are the skin cut, like who, what races, and when I bring in magazines, right, it's not, you know, I try and go and get a cross sector of magazines, for example. So using these tools to be able to look at those pieces. We're going to go. Thank you. Is that, was it off the whole time? No, good. Thank you. So when, <laughs> talking to myself, um, which I'm also good at. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in, a, in addition to looking at those tools and, and thinking about what's valued, what's, what's important, et cetera, going back to this as well, like if you're gaining some weight, you probably have food right? You have access to food. Many, uh, it, many, is, many people don't. Um, I've had, and thank you, Lena, even seeing your comment, I've had many people talking about how they eat meat and, and they get made fun of because they're way too thin and they don't gain that, that, mass, that body mass, right? So the spectrum is, we're, we, you know, we're not talking about it in terms of just looking at it in one way. Body image is all encompassing and it crosses cultures, uh, races, religion, size. Um, also, if you have facial disfigurement as well, about face is an organization that w works with people as well around that. And so what happens in terms of those pieces? So we come back to this media messaging in this slide again with what we are being, what we are, what we are facing and what we are almost overwhelmed with. And then as adults, if we're feeling this way, how then do our children feel? And how do they interpret these messages? Okay. And what are the facts and where do we find those quote unquote facts? What do we believe is true? Just uh, about a month ago on Twitter, Nedic posted something. I retweeted it. And then there was somebody that came on. I guess it was a troll. I'm not sure what was troll was, but someone said, oh, it was probably who just kept coming back as we're trying to sell that obesity is okay. We, you know, by me posting this. And, and so we sort of had to fight back and, and facts were used. The facts and actually in the tweet, the facts were that people, larger people, fat people were dying more so because of COVID and doctors are facts is. And so sometimes as well, are they fact? We really also need to be critical at the, the, the messaging that we're receiving even around the obesity epidemic and all of those pieces, right? 
And so being very critical of those pieces and maybe doing some of the research as well, connecting with organizations like NETIC, for example, right? So all of these derogatory terms, because I wouldn't even say fat and skinny is where it's limited to. Um, all of these derogatory terms, uh, right now I'm reading a book, uh, an amazing book called How to Be an Anti-Racist um, by Ibram Kendi. And in it, he also talks about uh, the piece of how um, colonialism has affected and the, slave, the transatlantic slave trade and racism has affected how even our youth or how we speak to each other in terms of shades and skin colors, et cetera, right? And how we'll, it'll be okay to say something because it's a joke right? Because it's between friends. But what are we perpetuating with that language, right? What are we perpetuating? So I will say to my students, I am fat. That's part of my identity, but I'm proud of it. I'm not, I don't apologize for it. I'm not waiting to diet to say that I love myself. I'm not waiting to get to a size. I don't put up a picture or hold up my old jeans that I used to get into and put it as a marker of this is what I, this is my goal. No, my goal is to be a good person. My goal is to be kind. My goal is to be inclusive and loving. And if that is in a thin body, a fat body, uh, what, you know, tall, short, white, black, what, you know, all of those pieces are all the beautiful pieces, but to that essential core of who we are, right? And I think if we can uh, move on to the next slide, uh, you know, one of the key elements that as educators we want to instill and, and I think Helen and I will also speak to the fact that, um, you know, this is a continue, this, this can be a bit of a battle in schools as well in terms of helping teachers realize the, the language and the, <clears throat> um, the messaging that we want to get out to students is that, that we really are looking at health at every size and health at every size in terms of embracing cultural differences, religious differences, uh, size differences in all of our, our kids. So really helping them, you know, helping our students and helping uh, adults realize that um, health needs to move way beyond that idea of the ideal weight. Um, you know, Helen spoke to it that, you know, we not putting up that picture of when I was a size two and saying, that's when I'm going to be worthy again, when I get back to that size, when I can put that jacket back on, uh, that's when I'm going to be happy. Uh, no, I need to focus on being emotionally healthy, physically healthy, and mentally healthy um, in the sh in the body that I'm in, and loving my skin color for the the color that it is, loving my hair for the days that it's curly, loving the days for the day that it, you know the days that it's flat, um, <clears throat> and helping our students realize that um, you know body sizes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and the size and the shape that they have is the right one for them. And so trying to, you know, compare themselves to somebody who's five inches taller, five inches shorter, um, it, it doesn't work because there's so many things inside our own bodies that um, predetermine what size we're going to be. Our height, our weight, you know, our bone structure, our skin color, our hair type. Um, you know, whether we're going to need glasses, whether we're going to need braces. Um, there's so many things that are so predetermined. We can, they are on be, beyond our control. So rather than spending thousands on the products that are sold to us to try and control those things, we've got, we need to learn how to appreciate and love ourselves for who we are. Um, trying to get across the idea of pleasure eating, you know, that um, eating is to put gas in the body in order for the body to be able to do it. And uh, so getting away from the whole idea of calorie counting, um, you know, labeling foods, and we're, we'll talk very quickly about, you know, not labeling foods as, as good and bad or healthy and junk. You know, we talk about with kids, everyday foods and sometimes foods. Um, you know, that cupcakes are an awesome sometimes food and they're a great food for celebrating a birthday. And sometimes they're a great food just because I want one today and that's okay. Um, you know, and getting that message across to, to the students uh, so that we're not having, you know, I often hear in junior classrooms, um, kids critiquing their lunches and, and trying to tell on each other that, you know, so-and-so ate their Rice Krispie Square before they ate their Apple Miss. Okay. 
I might do that too. If I hadn't a Rice Krispie Square in my lunch, I might want to eat that first too, and that's okay. Um, so getting away from thinking that we have to have, you know, the healthy foods first before we have the sometimes food. Um, it, it, it's rethinking every message that's going on. Um, encouraging our kids to just enjoy movement. You know, our, our kids come with all sorts of different interests, all sorts of different abilities, and just helping them to recognize that any kind of physical movement is great for our bodies. Just like I talked to the kids about how um, reading is exercising the brain and keeping the, the brain going. Um, you know, we've got to exercise our bodies and we've got to exercise them in different ways, but exercise looks different for everyone. For some people, it's running. For some people, it's playing soccer. For some people, it's yoga. For some people, it's dance. For some people, it's walking. Um, and just being able to enjoy physical movement and being able to get up and, and, and move and, and enjoy what our bodies can do is huge, especially at the young age. And if we can encourage that at a very young age, um, they'll take that into adulthood. Uh, which is which is huge. Just enjoying being out. Uh, I have to say, one of the things that I've noticed the most, probably, is since being home, is um, we have a number of trails behind where I live. I've never seen so many people on the trails, uh, which has been great. And seeing families walking together and riding their bikes, and kids out on scooters, and that's how it should be. It's just out enjoying, you know, nature and and being out and and moving together. Um, and finally. In the, and the most important message around health at every size, and we, um, there is an article that's attached to this uh, that's kind of up in the corner of the slide, and you will have access to that article uh, with a link uh, if you take a look at the slideshow afterwards, is that recognizing and confirming that there's beauty and worth in every body. Everybody is uh, special and unique and, and needs to be celebrated. Thank you. Um, we'll keep going. Great. Yep. Um, the the slide just before, and it's okay, Sarah, if you didn't if you don't go there because it connects exactly to this pyramid. Is we need to look at health, what healthy means in a different way, and I think this pandemic has really forced us to do that because it's. I know I, I, I um I have amazing colleagues that I work with, um, and we've created, with two of them that I adore, we've created a, a health and wellness site with a whole variety of different um, activities and different things for kids and parents and families to do. And we need to look at health, and it, you know, this has forced us to look at mental health as well. And we talk, we talk a lot about mental health. Does that connect when we talk about being healthy? Do we look at uh, this food for thought pyramid was introduced to me at a, at a netic conference a number of years ago and has really changed my thinking as well, right? We tend to, in the Western world, uh, in North America, we tend to focus on food and exercise as health, right? There's, you know, sometimes we get obsessive about it, right? So that is also a marker that we need to think about. Are we obsessing about if we did uh, you know, if we did that exercise today, if maybe we could, we're just exhausted, but we just have to do it, right? There's an obsession piece that we need to think about as well, um, right? The food that we're eating, as, as uh, Heather has stated as well, about always foods and sometimes foods, rather than yes and no foods, rather than good and bad foods. Um, this pyramid looks at all of the different pieces that connect to our health from socioeconomic factors, because you know what I'm going to tell you, being able to afford to go on a trip and take a vacation is huge. That's a huge piece to our health, right? Being able to get away, being able to, you know, that excitement. Or, for example, the relationships. We have the love in our life that we need, and I'm not talking about intimate relationships. I'm talking about people that care and love you, um, family and family you choose and family you don't choose to, right? Uh, your direct family and your extended family. Uh, I know today that there are lots of my family members right now sitting here listing people that I love and adore, that I've worked with, that are my friends, that are like my brothers and sisters now, right? Um, Manba aren't their direct Manbas, <laughs> but we are connected in that way. And that, con that social network has helped me even strengthen who I am, for sure. Our genetics, our emotional resilience, 
I love my favorite one, humor, optimism, and play, right? Can we giggle? Can we play? Can we play as adults? The play is not just for kindergarten students, right? Play is, as my wonderful friend Gail would say, play, we need to thread it all the way up to grade 12. That's not just play-based learning is not just learning for our kindergarten lovelies, right? So the, this, if you look at the tip, you have food and exercise, but look at the rest of this pyramid. Thank you, Amelia. You have it. I know. I feel like I need to get this printed in color and posted somewhere, right? Uh, I share it with my students, but uh, to have it up as a reminder all the time is really important. Heather, do you want me to keep going? Yeah, why don't you take us to the kind of the netic? Um... Okay, I'll go, I'll, yeah, exactly. Okay, sweet, thanks. Um, so when we look at our, these are the questions we, that we've asked you even from the beginning, right? What is the language? What is your bias? What is even your bias when you look in the mirror towards yourself? And today, what we hope is that this last point is that we're really helping you to continue. I know we're all on this journey, but to continue to challenge those misconceptions and myths. Sarah, if we can keep going, love. We've talked, and here is the example that Heather brought up as well. We don't want, we don't want, we, you know, we don't want to see this or hear this kind of language. When I say see, sometimes in our schools, a, a health activity I've seen in the past is, you know, you, we bring in all of our flyers and we cut and we put into two diagrams, you know, healthy foods and not healthy foods. And there's a message there. I'm sorry. Please don't tell me that the cake that I had that my wonderful sister baked that is unhealthy. We giggled and enjoyed it with my family. That's not going to have it all the time, but I shouldn't have a whole big bag of carrots either all at one sitting, right? It's all about moderation is what we're saying. And so the always foods we might find on our food guide, right? That's okay. Go ahead, Sarah. No, 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 honey. Right? We might find, but sometimes we need the sometimes foods, and that's good too. That's balanced. It's called balance in our lives. Okay, and so the problem, right, how do you feel? The problem isn't uh, our bodies, it's our thoughts, really, right, our attitudes. And we wanted just to embed some of these, you know, we're, we're bombarded with messages, but we wanted to bombard you today with some really beautiful messaging as well, right? Fall in love with taking care of yourself. You need to be body positive for always, not skinny for the summer right? Put on that bathing suit. I do, and I love it, and I love playing in the water just as much as the next person. Okay. Right? So, um, just before, Heather, because I see Jamie. Jamie, this is, your comment is spot on. This is, you know, with, with uh, what we've tried to do in different um, venues in terms of workshops and summer institutes with teachers specifically is start to really talk about the power we have in a classroom because I've seen that I had to challenge a colleague who berated one of my grade seven students a few years ago um, about that unhealthy cupcake that he was eating and guess what that student came back to me crying and he said this is what we have at home Miss V yeah. right so socioeconomically we need to really check our bias if we are if money for groceries, for example, for food is not really something we have to really think about, like, do I have enough? And for some, mm -hmm. it is going to dollar days at, and, and, and many of the communities, we talk about this as, as a staff, sometimes the dollar days at no frills and stocking up on Mr. Noodles is going to feed the family or going to McDonald's, right? I've had edu administrators even say it, McDonald's is bad, don't eat it. Well, you know what, sometimes going to McDonald's for my three kids to get the Happy Meal, first of all, could be a celebration, right? But also could be what I can afford, right? The socioeconomic impact of that is 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 real, right? Is real, and 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 really situating our like the class issues when we looked at food. So saying, oh my God, I'm getting fat right now during COVID nineteen. I I've responded to people by saying, I'm so happy to hear that because it means you have food. I'm so grateful that you have food right now to eat. Sorry, Heather, I just, I, thank you, Jane. Um, thank you for this, because I know that that is a rhetoric, that is a constant oftentimes in our schools, right? Miss Slimfast is not just that one teacher, right? Uh -huh. It happens so often, 
And so checking ourselves is key. Talking about our diets to our students. And no, that's okay. And Helen has, has uh, touched on it that you know we, we've done a lot of work with teachers and, and we would love to do it full time um, is to get the, the culture of the school changed from the staff room out um, because um, you should, you know, I, I think anybody who works uh, and has a staff room where they're sitting with other employees, ultimately the conversation always revolves around food. And people are checking out what each other's, you know, what's in each other's lunches and making assumptions and making evaluative statements. And then that, that comes out of the staff room and into the hallways. And uh, whether it's directly said to students, uh, it's being heard. So, you know, when we have teachers talking about, um, you know, having a Weight Watchers program at the school and that they're all going in on Friday morning and if they've lost their weight, then they can go out for lunch and celebrate. Um, Friday at lunchtime, the kids hear that. Um, you know, when when teachers are labeling foods good and bad, um, you know, when teachers are talking about, uh, well, you know, um, oh, you can't get me a box of chocolates for, for Christmas. Well, you know what, maybe that child saved up and spent all of their allowance to buy you that box of chocolates. So you slap a smile on your face and you say thank you because that child picked that especially for you. We've tried to do so much work around uh, the rethink of what teachers um, emulate and say and, and talk about. Um, and and it's, uh, it's an ever, it's an uphill battle at times. Um, but, you know, we, we hope that those who uh, attend workshops like this, uh, you know, as a, as a mentor of ours once said, uh, the right people are here and the answer's in the room. And I think the fact that you have shown up today um, because this is something that you're passionate about and you want to know about, um, that, you know, you take that message forward. So you start to uh, challenge uh, the people that you're working with, the people in your family, uh, the people who are saying the things around our kids that they don't need to hear and that they shouldn't hear uh, and that are inappropriate. And we don't need to hear because they're, they're not appropriate for us either. Um, so we're going to keep going here. <coughs> uh, so in terms of uh, being able to share a little bit about the body image curriculum with you. Um, the intent when we when we got together and then uh, kind of updated it in, in the last couple of years is that we wanted something uh, that was inclusive for uh, teachers that, um, you know, brought in a number of the key issues that we need to be talking about in our classrooms uh, and gave an opportunity for uh, it not to be what we would call an add-on, not one more thing that teachers had to do, but rather being a tool that teachers could use to um, get to media literacy, to get to language arts foundations, to get to arts content in our classrooms, um, and to be able to do it while also using key messages that we need to be um, talking about in our classrooms, so helping to break down some of the biases and the stereotypes and the discrimination that's happening in our classrooms. Uh, we can do this through arts activities, we can do this through media literacy, we can do this through language activities. So that was really one of our key intents in developing this, this um, curriculum. And uh, while, you know, we're at home right now, whether you're uh, a parent or an educator or wearing both hats, um, you know, it's a great, it's a free curriculum. It's available on the Natic website. And there are some great activities on there. You don't necessarily have to do them as a full lesson. You can flip through. There's some great media links. There's great videos to watch as kind of a motivating or a minds-on activity. And then there's some follow-up activities that are really great for the kids to use. So we want to be able to um, share some of those with you today just very uh, briefly, uh, but we encourage everybody who's here with us today to go on and take a look at them and, um, you know, and see what you could, what you can bring into your own house. And again, they're, they're good for, you know, ages four <laughs> up to 18. Um, you know, the discussions that you're going to have with your own kids are going to take the lessons where they need to go. Um, so we'll take a look at some of them now. And I'm noticing that people are adding on some other great links here. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, so in taking, sorry, sorry, Sarah, <laughs> this is perfect. 
Uh, so in taking a look at the grade four uh, curriculum, um, really when we were looking at this, we were focusing on trying to develop uh, and maintain positive relationships and friendship, uh, building up that positive self-esteem and starting to stand up to bullies because uh, as we know, um, you know, by the time our kids are eight, nine years old, um, there are huge influences on each other and they, and they really take each other's attitudes and perceptions and thoughts about themselves seriously. Um, you know, and what students say to each other can have a huge influence. So the, the, some of the uh, opportunities in this unit really take a look at what it means to be a good friend and being, uh, you know, developing positive friendships with, uh, positive relationships with friends. Uh, and then uh, having the opportunity to share some positive messaging through things like blogs, poems, chants, or raps. And I know that uh, with some of my students, they love doing the raps in class because uh, you know they, they get to do kind of a backbeat with it and they get to get the, the uh, musical instruments out. And um, so we just have an example on the next slide of, of a portion of a, um, a poem that one of the, the students had written in my class a couple of years ago which was really neat um, just to talk about, you know, how uh, even the perception of what the child looks like is different depending on who's talking to the child. You know, they're, they're hearing that they're too tall from their friends, but parent, you know, parents are telling them that they're too small. Um, you know, that uh, there's too many freckles on his face, but uh, you know, he, he's proud of them. He calls them his power spots. Um, so that's, uh, that's an opportunity and that, that's a great activity that can be done easily at home. Uh, you know, encouraging kids to do a little bit of rhyming um, and to, you know, even take the lyrics of a song and change them uh, to, to be about themselves. I'm just taking a look at some of the questions. Yeah, here. Just to add, um, yeah, just to jump in and then I'll give you grade five back. Uh, Hip hop pedagogy is a huge, you know, there's so many beautiful things happening uh, in terms of access to hip hop. Uh, curriculum and hip-hop pedagogy, there's, you know, often a very negative connotation when we hear hip-hop and rap, et cetera. But for many, not just performers, and uh, hip-hop is is uh, a way to, to free yourself and to share your message. Spoken word poetry, I do all the time. I'll talk about it afterwards uh, in the intermediate curriculum as well. But uh, that that sort of piece as well is, is so important and connected to our kids. We need to be responsive to what they like as well and what they and, and allow them to use that voice to share their knowledge back with us. And that's what Heather was just sharing in terms of that rap piece, right? Great. And then um, in our grade five curriculum, we, we took a look at uh, taking a look at actually you know, the purpose of advertisements and focusing on PSAs or public service announcements and helping students to realize that um, commercials don't necessarily have to be just about selling a product or trying to get people to buy something, uh, but they can be a great way to get messaging through. Um, so, you know, taking a look at some of the different public service announcements that are out there. Uh, we started with one today from NetEc, a uh, very brief one, but there are some wonderful, there are some other wonderful sites out there that have some great public service announcements. Um, you know, talking about honesty, talking about respect, talking about, uh, you know, how we treat each other. So having the students create something and, and through art, uh, being able to create their own public service announcement, what would you want your friends to know? Or what would help um, other kids your age to know um, about, you know, how to, how to respect themselves and how to respect others? So we've got just, again, again another quick um, example on the next slide here. Um, of one that students had done a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, the, the wonderful thing at home right now and, and with distance learning as well as being in classrooms is uh, what students can do, what kids can do online. There are so many great uh, websites and, and um, applications on uh, our different devices that allow them to create posters and, and to embed images and, and um, phrases together that they, they can absolutely have amazing products come out um, and frankly are far better than <laughs> what some of the advertising companies are coming up with these days. 
Yeah, we're ha we're going to keep going for a few more minutes. So if anybody can stick around, we appreciate everybody who is here. Um, and uh, you know, if you have to go, we totally understand. But um, please stick around. We'll we'll keep going for probably another ten minutes or so. I'll turn it over to you, Helen. Or do you want me to do this one? We could tag team this one, and then I'll go into seven eight if you want. Sure. Yeah. So taking a look at magazines as well. Heather, do you want to we talk a little bit? <clears throat> and yeah. then I'll go in and I'll talk about these student examples that we have. Sure. Uh, so in grade six, again, okay. we, we kind of um, <clears throat> go forward. It's a further in-depth look at um, really the analysis of media. So taking a look that uh, around the key ideas that media has a form, a purpose, and an audience. Uh, you know, what is what is the purpose of the media that's being created, whether it's a magazine uh, ad, whether it's a commercial on TV, it's a radio spot, what are they trying to do? Um, are they trying to inform, entertain, or, you know, is it something to persuade you to buy something? Uh, so students will have an opportunity to take a look critically at a number of different media. Uh, and one of the most interesting things I know I've found in the last couple of years with students is realizing, you know, a lot of them don't actually watch commercials on TV anymore because they don't necessarily watch live TV. But taking a look at some of the little YouTube commercials that now come up before YouTube videos where they only have 10, 12 seconds to get um, a point across and getting this, the kids to take a look at some of those ads and what's being shown there, what, and getting them to really analyze uh, those images very quickly. Uh, and then the, the intent at the end is to create um, a magazine, a short magazine, um, eight pages, and that would be promoting body image and self-esteem uh, in younger kids. And it's great when you can do this in the classroom because they can go down and share it with a kindergarten grade one class. And it's amazing uh, how much pride the, the students have in their work when they do create these uh, magazines. And Helen's gonna share a couple of examples with you. So these are collages that we created uh, when I taught grade six a few years ago. Um, and the focus I said to the kids is to really look at the magazines. My first focus was to try and find representation of all different people. And I had tried to bring a cross sector of magazines in because that's also a big piece is what we're what we're bringing to the kids. And I had I had tried my best and you know, we had this amazing conversation as we didn't see a lot of people from our world represented. And so then I said, okay, what, what are we going to do about this? And we decided to create these collages, but then to embed these messages, the slogans, because the grade five curriculum also looks at how we can, how we can use text in terms of slogans or headings, et cetera. And so here are two examples, right, um, that two of my students that year created. You know, love who you are, as you are, was another message um, as well. So really analyzing those magazines. And even when we have magazines uh, that represent different identities, um, taking a look as well and being critical in those magazines as well, right? Um, is skin lighter? Is body thinner? Body's thinner? Um, what are the angles, right? Those camera angles as well. So if we could go next into the grade seven curriculum, what we're really talking about here, um, not just in the grade seven, but it, it's here, is that we're actually creating a counter narrative, right? We're, up, we're taking that um, messaging in our world that we're bombarded with. Please do, do not, you know, there's a reason. Don't kid yourself that the, the diet and sort of beauty industry, the reason why it's a billion dollar industry, there is a direct reason why, right? They're playing at sort of our, our weaknesses and our, and our insecurities. And so we need to fight back. We need to stand up. We need to create a counter narrative now is what we're talking about. And that's not language we only use because now it's grade seven and they're a little bit older and they're in the intermediate grades. We talk about it as a young, young kids too, we're creating a counter narrative. The narrative is, you know, this. Well, okay, well, let's look at that, let's analyze it, let's be critical, and now let's present a counter narrative. And in the grade seven curriculum, we're really looking at this book was one of our, you know, what is beautiful? So books 
I love books, but books is a huge piece as well, right? The text, what text are we using and why? We have to be critical. Who is writing them? Who is presenting them? What's the wording in them, right? So really countering those appearance ideals. Who decides what is beautiful? So even um, one idea that you can bring into your home as well with your kids, if we go to the next slide, is even, the next slide is even looking at quotes, right? And analyzing quotes and what are our perceptions? Um, everything has beauty, but not everyone sees it, right? And so, uh, you know, a beauty is a light in the heart. And so if we go into the grade eight curriculum as well, and that, that counter narrative is continued where we're really critically analyzing um, as well, but we take it almost full circle. Not that you have to do this every, every single year, et cetera. I've used some grade four activities with my seven eights, for example. It's so transferable. It's connected, that, that language curriculum is so beautifully open-ended that it really, the arts curriculum as well, it really does lend itself uh, to being able to do cross, um, especially if you're a combined grade teacher, if you're an educator, you know, it really lends itself to being able to teach all the kids together, et cetera, as a little plug you should be doing anyways with every curriculum. But here is, the, the, we, we ask students to now take a look at their own self-image, right, and how they present themselves and that, pot, and, and that um, online image that they have as well, and how they present themselves with that. And we know as adults, we may have friends on our Instagram feeds and our Facebook walls that are presenting images sometimes that you're like, mm, yeah, no, that's not real. But that, that need to have to present this beautiful, perfect life, even on social media. But we're taking kids back. To, to really looking at what, how do I present myself, and then how do I use that to propel myself to make a difference as well, and taking it into an actionable item. We try to create those action items, so whether they're creating a magazine, whether they're putting up their collages, whether it's the messaging is also coming from students for students, right, by students for them as well. So they're analyzing, but then they're analyzing their own even as well as they create. So in grade eight, for example, uh, we've included here, um, if we go to the next slide, these three R's of responsible media, right? Is the media that we're looking at reliable, respectful, and representative? And I learned this, uh, my, my wonderful course director years ago when I did Media Literacy Part 1, we actually asked permission from him to be able to use this because we couldn't find it really situated anywhere online or in an, into any text, but we really use this within the the course that I was doing, and I thought this is beautiful. And we, we wanted you as parents and educators to be able to take something that you could use at a pinch as well. Is this reliable? Is it respectful? And then is it representative? Is it representative of, of you as a family or of, of society as well? You know, but your family as a microcosm of society. Yes. So as we go forward um, and we we take a look at maybe wrapping up some of the key ideas that we'd like uh, you to take away today. Um, you know, it's really the idea that we want to teach our kids from a, from a young age that self worth is not related to how they look. So, uh, you know, that we're praising them for a number of different things that we do. We praise them for making their bed. We praise them for picking up their toys. We praise them for the great book they read. Um, you know, we praise them for. Uh, different behaviors and activities and not necessarily because you know she's got the the perfect curls today or he's got the big muscles um, you know that we're we're aware of what we're praising our kids for and that we're creating a self-concept in them that is bigger than the package of, of what they look like um, you know we want to really emphasize the positive aspects of eating you know, uh, Helen spoke about the fact that if we have food and we are putting on weight right now, that that's a sign that we we you know, have the ability to have food in our houses, and we and we should be appreciative of that right now. Um, you know, there are so many families out there right now that are struggling to make sure that there is food on the table each night, um, and so we want to appreciate food and enjoy it. Uh, being able to sit and eat together as a family. Is a privilege not many families get to do that anymore I know even in our family um, my husband typically works evenings and and uh, having dinner together every night for the last eight weeks 
uh, has been amazing because we don't do that. Um, and so dinners in our house have been quite fun because my, my son is helping to choose them and prepare them. Um, I'll totally admit I'm not the cook, um, so I just enjoy them. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's a time where we all sit there and we, and we talk. And, it, and I, I, can't, uh, I can't be thankful enough for that opportunity to, to sit and talk together each night. Um, you know, we just want to model a healthy lifestyle. A little bit of everything. Everything in moderation is good. Exercise is good in moderation. Food is good in moderation. Uh, taking care of our, our mental wellness is, wellness is good in mo moderation. Everybody needs to sit and read a book. Everybody needs to sit and watch a movie. Everybody needs to sit and play a card game. Um, and we do everything in moderation, okay? Uh, and then we're just encouraging self-awareness and critical thinking skills. Uh, you know, when our kids are watching a show on TV or they're watching a video on YouTube, watching it with them and having the opportunity to stop and talk about things and say, you know, well, why do you think that happened? Or why do you think they put it that way? Uh, and starting to create those critical thinking skills in our students and our kids so that they realize that um, you know, there, there's somebody behind the scenes who's creating that image that they're seeing. And yes, we can enjoy it. And yes, we, you know, we, we can enjoy the movie and we can enjoy the show, but we also need to know that it, it that it's pretend and that it's, and then it's, it's done to, uh, inform or entertain, but it's not necessarily indicative of what's really happening in the world. Okay. So, um, so those are some of the ideas. The next two slides as well, we've embedded some videos as well. So there are some videos from Dove uh, that really counter, you know, that, that, that narrative um, that we're talking about. It's specific to girls. A lot of this work, and we didn't start with this, but a lot of the work uh, traditionally has been situated uh, within the female body, if you will, because it's been a women's issue. And I would argue and say it is still primarily a women's issue. However, if we click to the next slide, we also wanted, we didn't want to negate the fact that this is really affecting our boys. Okay. And this uh, video clip that we have, we've linked here is a, um, a news report of these two young boys uh, around high school age, you know, who are, you know, they really want the six packs because they want the girls, they say, right? Again, so we're also looking at a very heterosexual na narrative as well, right? Not saying that this doesn't permeate into um, into our gay community as well, LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, but we're, th that's when we're looking at the issue, that's the facets are all encompassing and all inclusive, right? So in terms of even looking at um, in one of the Dove vi videos uh, with the woman, the close-up of the woman's face, um, it's really looking at how um, Photoshop changes her face. And so what's up in the billboard is actually not even what her face looks like. And I remember in one of the collages that my kids made that year, um, and I've done it a few times, one of the kids said they don't even look like what they look like was their slogan, right? And so who are we trying to, when we put up that ad, Who we, we are trying to be something that doesn't even exist except from by a computer. Right. And so the inequities are so multilayered. And, and I know Michelle um, earlier talked about that, that the pandemic now has really uncovered a lot of inequities in terms of food inequities, tech inequities, even. Right. The fact that we can do this, who is able to access this webinar as well. Right. Um, there are some that might not be able to. I know some of my students are still waiting for technology to be able to access even some of our uh, remote learning that we're doing as well. And so going back here using the technology. The technology is now also being used to distort what we look like as well in those magazines. Having those conversations. This issue affects us all, boys and girls. We've we've tended in the past to really focus on the growth and the and the um even looking at the research, the research available is very focused on girls as well and females, if you will. But it's changing. It's changed within the last, I would say even 10 years, where the the focus now is looking at more inclusively in terms of um, boys and girls as well, and those who identify in those bodies. And, okay. And so really a key question. Imagine, I say this sometimes to my friends and some of them will roll their, some of them are on here with me and they've rolled their eyes at me when I said, what if we obsess about how beautiful you are? 
and how this is, you know, how, how much we love ourselves. We're so quick to talk about what we don't. You know, we're, we're obsessing about, and I'm doing it too. I need to go get my eyebrows done. My right, white, you know, my grays are showing. My, this, we're doing it too, right? And it's, it's about stopping and sort of going, okay, okay, let me stop that right now, right? Because that narrative is so powerful that it, it, it no matter even if you're conscious of it, you, you get caught in that like, oh, 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 you know? So. And I just want to thank uh, some of you who are sharing some of the personal stories uh, in the chat. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of us can relate to it. I, I think probably many of us are here because, uh, you know, this is, this is a topic that is of personal importance to us or to someone that we love and care about. And I think one of the most important things is that, uh, you know, if we go back to that whole idea of what body image is, it's not only, um, a person's own self-perception but it's what we perceive other people are seeing about us and if we can kind we can't necessarily um, you know fix the inside voice in a family member um, but we can be the outer voice that they're hearing and is helping them to realize that they are loved and special and have self-worth um, and sometimes that outer voice needs to kind of keep um, reiterating it until uh, you know the person that we love starts to hear it internally too so and and I will say my my inside voice is, is one that I battle with on a daily basis um, and uh, you know uh, my my husband is one who has to kind of hit me over the head sometimes with the outer voice <laughs> um, but I but I need him to do that every once in a while as a check so I think um, you know if we can support our, our kids at home and our, and our family and our loved ones with being the outer voice that's helping to kind of give them a better self-perception, um, it will start to internalize, okay? Um, so I think um, if we just kind of head to the, the last couple of I slides. think we could, I just want to, I just want to, I'm actually not a proponent of reading slides to people, but I will read this one. Yeah. You are not a size, you are not a weight. You are not a color, you are not an age, you are not a trophy, you are not a doll, you are not stupid, you are not an image, you are not an advert. You are a beautiful, wonderful, strong human being and all your layers are so valuable and worthy. So to finish it, like it off, reminds yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, um, this right. is uh, something that we've had for many years. We've used the geode to kind of end off some of our workshops, just in talking about how, you know, the outer layer of a geode, um, you know, we would we would often assume is quite plain and and uninteresting, and and we may walk past it if we were to to see it on the you know on, on a bunch of rocks. Uh, but when we take a look at the inside of a geode, each one is unique and special and sparkly. And uh, that's what we want to continue to encourage that we celebrate with, with the kids uh, that we work with, that we live with, that we love. Um, and so we want to thank you all for being with us today. Um, yeah. And uh, as always, we are always happy to continue the discussion. Um, yes. Our email addresses are in the slideshow if you access it, and uh, we're more than happy to send out any ideas, um, resources, strategies that we have. Thank you for being patient with all the tech stuff. Thank you for being present. Um, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. Um, please, this needs to be like the domino effect, right? Or, we need to put up those dominoes and push the first one. You are that first one. Go and share this. Share this with five other people. Let them share with five and five and five. What a great math question, right? How many would be affected? And so um, we share our hearts with you today, right? We hope that you will go and continue sharing um, your hearts as well. And while we can't see who you are and everything, we know. We know and, and we appreciate you taking the time and we and we see you and we thank you yes do thank not you. hesitate to
connect with us. Yeah. We mean that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Netic. As always, we love you so much. <laughs>